Thank you so much for jumping in, uh, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on uh, all the places you listen to podcasts, wherever you're receiving the media. Thank you very much for tuning back into the Cole Evans podcast. I have Bill Harper with me today. If you are on LinkedIn um, and TikTok specifically, if you are focused in the, all things in the marketing uh, industry as I am, uh, Bill Harper is not a new name to you. With over 21,000 followers on LinkedIn, that number seems to be growing by the day. And over 112, the last time I looked, 112,000 uh, of your followers, if you will, Bill, are on TikTok. Uh, yeah, Bill is the is CEO and chief, chief creative officer at WMH in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, also has uh, Brand Boss. Uh, WMH. Uh, let's let's kind of differentiate a little bit, Bill. Tell our audience a little bit about number one. Thank you very much for being on the Cole Evans podcast. Oh, Tell our audience a, a little bit of, uh, of the difference between WMH and Brand Balls. If they stalk you on LinkedIn, they're going to see that you get two different companies running now. Tell our audience a little bit about those. Yeah, so WMH is more of a traditional full service agency that focuses on businesses between twenty five million and about half a billion. Okay. Um, and Brand Boss was really a result of the emerging businesses under 20, 25 million that were interested after I got on TikTok. Um, and there was sort of a groundswell of, hey, can you work with us? Can you talk with us? Et cetera. That came from that. And Brand Boss was um, a business that we created that scaled down a bunch of those fundamentals that the larger organizations use to help those small companies accelerate their growth and to gain traction. So Bill, how long have you been on TikTok? Uh, we just celebrated a year a couple of days ago. Wow. Okay. So tell me about that journey. Was it Bill sitting around the room with his team and saying, hey guys, we're getting on TikTok or was it like the reluctant pull into the channel? I was totally shamed into doing it to be perfectly honest. Okay, so, there you uh, go. Contemporary of mine, Tom, um, came to me and he said, I think that you should be on TikTok and I think you'd be good at it. And I, I just laughed at him. I was like, no, I won't even let my kids on TikTok. Like, I, no, I'm not gonna go on TikTok. And he kept after me for months. He kept after me and was like, listen, um, you really should go on the platform. I really, I don't think you understand what its real value is. You know, you gotta kind of look past what you see when you first get there of like kids dancing and lip syncing songs and like all that. He's like, there's actually a lot more to it beneath mm -hmm. all that. Right. Um, and, you know, he just kept after me. And finally, one day I was like, all right, I'm gonna prove him wrong. So I got on and, um, it it blew up. So I, you know, it was I went to go prove him wrong and then he proved me wrong. So that's that's how that started. So what would you say would be the biggest takeaway, whether it was the first 30 days? I don't really care about the time frame, but just getting started right in the first few months. What would you say was your uh, it looks like you have a few gray hairs in your hair like me. So we're, we're of a certain generation. Right. Yeah. What uh, what was your biggest takeaway from kind of getting or getting started specifically in TikTok? Yeah. So the first thing was, like everybody else, I had two hurdles to kind of overcome. The first was I, I'm an in-person guy. And to your point, you know, uh, my generation is an in-person group, like we're a yeah. handshake and a hi, how are you? And like, right. you know, so this this whole visual digital Zoom interface thing that came after uh, the pandemic is really kind of new territory. The second is I don't think about trying to have a conversation with a piece of plastic. So it was really kind of hard to think, you know, I'm, I don't want to lip sync songs and I don't want to just gain followers for the fun of following. And I don't right. want to do, you know, sort of the mindless brain dump stuff that's on there. I actually want to talk about something. And I, to be honest, I wasn't sure that there would be an audience there. So I think that was the biggest surprise for me was, you know, going on and sort of fumbling through that first couple of posts. Sure. And then seeing somebody respond to it. And the first response, you forget all that, right? The minute that somebody has a question for you, you kind of forget all that and you go, oh, somebody needs something. And you drop back into, hey, I have a job to do here. And the minute that that fell into place, that piece kind of fell into place, all of a sudden this made sense. Um, and so it like the nervousness about it and the discomfort about it all fell away. And it was like, oh, OK, I know what I'm supposed to do here. And I think that was the biggest piece. I would say that my biggest takeaway from the TikTok experience is that TikTok's greatest value is mini mentorship. Like if you want to learn how to make, you know, one sixteenth scale size balsa wood 
ships from Star Wars, there's a thousand hours in three minute segments of mm -hmm. just how to glue the wood or just how to paint it just right to make it look like, you know, laser blast or whatever. Like right. it doesn't matter what you're into. There's, there's a group of people out there that are just as passionate about it as you are, who are willing to share things. And once I discovered that that was the case, everything else took off because it wasn't like, it wasn't worrying about, oh my gosh, I have to create content. It was, oh, this is an opportunity to share something that I know. And that made it fun. So you're gonna be able to follow uh, Bill, all the links and all the places where the words are, wherever you're watching, make sure to follow uh, Bill on both LinkedIn and TikTok. Quick question, did you have a pretty substantial following on, on LinkedIn when you got into TikTok or did you see both kind of rise with the tide when you started really kind of pumping out more content? No, it, it's interesting. The LinkedIn experiment was something that I started almost 10 years ago and yeah. I had very much like TikTok, no following on LinkedIn whatsoever. There were the couple people that I knew and, you know, it was friends and family kind of thing. And I, I gave myself a goal of hitting 20,000 first connections. That's what I wanted to do. And I'm about two inches away from actually succeeding on that. But what I did was I just started reaching out to people that were a combination of people in my industry, uh, perfect target audience groups that I wanted to ultimately get to know. And what surprised me, uh, and then also thought leaders, right? People that I respected that were in this, the, the Seth Godin's of the world and the Simon Sinek's of the world. And, you know, the people that were in our industry that sure. had a meaningful voice and that were saying something really relevant. And I just gently began connecting with these people and that gained momentum over time. So after a while, you know, I would be reaching out to a company I was interested in and I would get these responses back and it was like, oh my God, you know, everybody, like, how are you connected to all these different people? And I was like, well, I'm, I made it my job to reach out and talk with them. And then along the way, someone would say, hey, we've never spoken, but I see that you're connected to so-and-so and I'm trying to get a job over there, or I'd really like to make a connection with them. Would you mind making an introduction? And every time that happened, I would try to facilitate some kind of communication start or bridge for them. Yeah. And in doing that, um, it just, you know, the momentum just built over time. TikTok was, of course, much, much faster than that. But yeah, nonetheless, sure. it was a it was a really interesting experiment. So, Bill, let's. Uh, so, it sounds like uh, aside from experience, aside from um, having two different kind of segmentations of business based on annual revenue, you've got uh, kind of your hands in a in a few different business pots, right? Very, very large. They really don't need to have some of the fundamentals because they've probably got a handful of agencies managing that for them. To people that maybe inherited. Uh, had a chunk of money and did a startup, they acquired, right? Everyone and all things in between. So here's my question. If we if we kind of draw a common line through what are the things, I, I'm kind of looking in the mirror as I say this, there's this kind of constant thing that I say or constant things that I say, whether it's on a prospect sure. or my biggest client, I say it all the time. I, I get sick of saying it. I'm asking you, what is that thing or things that you find, whether it's uh, I've seen on your on your website, you've got you know huge testimonials from six year tenured clients. Uh, up to just a few months of engagement that were, you know, hitting you know, huge high points. What's the common conversation that you're having with all of them? The biggest thing that businesses are missing, and there's really two. The first is they don't have their def their purpose defined well. They're trying to be too many things to too many people. Yeah. And in doing that, they're actually standing in the way of the progress that they're trying so hard to achieve, you know, and I remind them Volvo just sells safety. Harley mm. Davidson just sells freedom. Nike just sells progress. These brands have strategically locked down on one thing that they're really selling through. And in doing that, it makes it really easy to stay on brand and on message because you're not trying to satisfy so many different things. Even with Nike, which is a brilliant example because they are so bifurcated in, in the three axes that they have to do. They have to do age, they have to do reason to be athletic, and they have to do support group. So, uh, and well, and product, I mean, you're gonna add that as well. So when you really think about that 3D model to be equally relevant to the person who is 
um, you know, just been told that they have to lose body weight or they're going to have a health issue to LeBron James. Like that's a spectrum. And then to right. go across all the different sports is a spectrum. And then, oh, well, we also do the tech and the community support that you need in order to do it. They couldn't do that if they were trying to market to each one of those. Like if they mm -hmm. tried to run advertising against swimming and then the next one was against running and then the next one was against that, like they'd go broke trying to spread themselves that way. Mm -hmm. By staying up at that one idea, they're able to become efficient in how they market and say uh, their sales and marketing rather becomes efficient. Most businesses don't have that tool in their toolbox. And so when you come to work with them, what you find is, you know, a lot of descriptive copy. We are an advertising agency that does this and then we do it better than anybody else. And it sounds so repetitive to the rest of the groups that are in the category that there's, they're, again, they're pushing themselves into being considered or seen as a commodity. My job is to help them find that one message that lets them say, hey, we stand for this or we solve this or we benefit you this one way. And in doing that, then it becomes relevant to people because they can opt in, which ultimately makes sales easier and conversion right. more efficient, which is what they need in order to grow. The other thing is there's a lot of digital dependency at the bottom of the funnel. There has become like, there's just such an addiction to all I need to do is social and digital. It's going to be zero waste. And I'm going to go right to that one person. And they don't realize that the rest of the funnel needs to be there. Um, you know, I, I have a thing on TikTok that I use all the time, which is, you know, if I asked you if you wanted to buy a Honda or a Voodoo do, which one would you say? You're always going to say Honda. And when I ask you why, you're going to say, because I've never heard of a Voodoo do. That's the awareness level up at the top of the sales funnel that people are ignoring. So helping them to understand that a channel is a channel is a channel. Mm -hmm. No one is a silver bullet. What we need to do instead is talk about what is an appropriate use of the channels based on the budget you have against the goals you're trying to reach. Yeah. So many companies have gone to tactics before strategy. Mm -hmm. They just they've lost that that bit of thinking time in there because they're constantly chasing some sort of, you know, needle movement. And that's, that's really gotten them short term focus. And it's really hurting businesses ability to scale at all levels. Last year, uh, I guess it was uh, November, I'm sorry, 22. I, I was contracted by an agency that was one of the agencies for a very large uh, HVAC manufacturing company in North America. And uh, that led us down this path of me getting a couple other clients in the country. And I really had this kind of conversation about predictive modeling. And yeah. so uh, I'll, I'll uh, add more minutes onto our podcast for this. But um, if you look at our website, we built out a product called Predictive Buyer Pro. And when, when you're talking about uh, kind of being jack of all trades, you know, master of none when it comes to service lines, I think about the conversation I had in the beginning of 2023 with our data team here right outside of Nashville. And we were building this predictive model and uh, we took 800 uh, customer records out and it puts them into tier one, two, and three, and then what they call non-prospect. And so it lines out, now I'm in this conversation, we're, we're in this, uh, this meeting and the data team said, look, here's what we know. We know in business, you want a four to be a three, a three to be a two, and a two to be a one. You want everybody to buy that one little thing and then to buy the big thing. And then everyone's just gonna be your best customer. And he goes, in, in data, we just know that's not how it works. We right. know that you gas one and two, you kill three and four, and that's how you move the needle. And so I'm thinking about that when you're talking about how many service lines and when you're, when you're, and I really appreciate you saying, bringing awareness back to the conversation, the top of the funnel is so important. And specifically, and, and, and I know you're in a lot of different industries, I have really kind of three main focuses, uh, home service businesses, manufacturing and healthcare. Home service really painting a broad brush, but they, they truly live and die by the weather and by lead gen. And I, I don't know if you would agree, but I don't think PPC as we know it today is going to be PPC in two years. I think things are moving at a much faster pace that the way that we uh, engage with brands, the way that we truly convert a lead is just going to be different. Um, so th that being said, I, I really, I wrote a note here, tactics before strategy. That's a consistent, com I'm glad to hear that's a consistent conversation in your world. It's definitely a consistent uh, conversation in mind. Tell me a little bit, uh, Bill, about learning. So I am 43. 
Uh, I am uh, at the core a salesperson, and so I am always like the world's on fire. And you know, I, I was I was kind of raised in a professional career of you know how much are we closing today, this week, this month, and then into sales management. It was always about ringing the bell, right? Mm -hmm. And so I say that in context to say that now I'm a little bit longer in the tooth in the industry, and and um, um, have kind of gone through uh, those you know lessons, if you will. Uh, I have not always been this person, but I really dedicate time. I really try to actually put this stuff on my calendar, but I really try to time block and learn. That might be in more practices about search engine marketing. It might be about all things AI. Tell me a little bit about what Bill is carving out time to learning in 2024. Maybe you're bite-sizing it right now, the big goal. What's something that's kind of on your to-do list this year to learn more about? So I'm, I'm a voracious reader. Like I, okay. I am definitely one of those who believes the adage that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know anything about anything because mm. everyone's point of view is relevant as it relates to their experience and as it relates to their ability to be a specialist in something, right? True. Everyone has some measure of subject matter expertise in their particular thing from, you know, the artist who knows just how to hold or, sh or, or, you know, sharpen a pencil to get the stroke that they want to, you know, a surgeon, right? Like everybody is an artist in this respect and in such everybody's point of view becomes another piece to the puzzle. So I'm constantly on the hunt for that. AI, of course, has my attention. It's funny. I, I saw a TikTok video yesterday that caught my attention, a woman that was really sort of shell-shocked in a positive way by Adobe's 2024 summit presentation about the impact AI will have on automating the development of social digital creative assets. And the thing that got her revved up in this um, post that she made was, oh my God, it was minutes, not months, which apparently was the, the phrase, the soundbite that Adobe really wanted everybody to hear because they used it several times was, you know, we're turning months into minutes, right? So it's, it's watch how easily we can automate a couple of prompts that can be, you know, going out and creating verbiage from, uh, you know, chat GBT, whichever version of that you're using, and then draw upon assets that are already pre-approved within the bucket. They happen to be using Coca-Cola, but that could have been anybody. And then we're also generating background. So here's a bottle that we want to promote. Here's a background that we've created against a series of prompts that we have. And here's a new headline that falls within our standards. And look, we can hit a button and boop, now there's a thousand pieces and you could just watch the people in the audience be like oh that's amazing but what they weren't paying attention to is a couple of things and this is why i like to read up on these things and pay attention to them rather than just let them kind of wash over me number one yeah it's amazing but the lighting didn't match the backgrounds weren't well thought through there was no yep. dimensionality to it the headlines didn't attach themselves to anything it was faster and easier but by no means better. It yeah. was an efficient display. And I think that there's certainly room for that, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, we can fire everybody now because all we have to do is hit this button. And I fear that that's exactly where it's gonna go is dump a bunch of pre-developed, pre-approved assets in this thing. We're mm -hmm. gonna spit it out. And then we're gonna immediately go to, um, you know, uh, optimizing the efficiency of this thing and all of it's going to be programmatic and all of it's going to be AI driven and they're going to tell us what's what's working. My question is, where's the new idea supposed to come from? Because right. AI isn't able to do that. And so right. I think in the short term, which is again, my worry with everybody being so short sighted right now, it's going to be like, oh my gosh, this is great and we can save money. So let's get rid of people in order to use this tool and we'll use it. And Adobe is going to swell up and get a bunch of money. And then so these are the kinds of things that have my attention. How are websites going to change? Like there's yeah. so much dependency on going to websites and how that represents companies. And I think that that's one of those places that's going to make a huge pivot in the next few years. I think that websites are going to be less promotional materials for the brand exclusively, and they're going to expand into edutainment things. Think about them almost like mini magazines, um, educational platforms, things that people would return to even if they didn't use the brand 
as a resource for where they can gain education and see, you know, uh, oh, uh, Bill dissected a, a campaign and I can learn something about that. Or I'm a, I'm a student of advertising and I'm coming up in my career and here are some things that they wrote about at the agency that, you know, are helpful or interesting to me. I think it's going to become wider. I think, I think social media, digital media, and being online, businesses are going to have to realize that they are now a media channel and that's mm. a whole new ball of wax. So I'm, I'm watching things like that. And then of course, there's always history, right? There is nothing new under the sun. We're watching everything repeat itself. So the other big thing is, you know, Simon Sinek writes about uh, business. Peter Drucker wrote about business. Seth Godin writes about business and all of them use a little bit different vocabulary. All of them are focused on a slightly different part of what they think is the most important sure. piece of it. I find all of that stuff fascinating. I, there's just, there's way less time I have left in my life than there is stuff that I would, <laughs> would like to read and consume. It's a it's a very good point. Uh, experts uh, experts in their field, but all coming from all three of those, I could literally just kind of see their content as you were as you were saying it. And, and I will tell you, Bill, while not having um, you know, I, I'm sure a team like uh, a Gary V or you know, say a, a Tony Robbins behind you, uh, I'll tell you, man, as someone who's just getting to know you, and uh, you know, a few months into watching your story and content. It, it looks like a machine that you've built there, right? So you've got a lot of really good stuff coming out. I really like just, um, I, I should have probably started off this way, but you know, I'm a no, there, I think there's so much just straight up bullshit on most channels these days. And so for me, when there's like straight shooter, you know, everything's on the table. I'm not trying to, you know, sell you some silver bullet theory, um, you know, packet. Uh, I, I really connect with that. So, Bill, I really appreciate your time. I do have one last question here. But for our audience, if you have not taken about six seconds, hit pause on this and do it now. Follow me, subscribe, hit all, hit all the buttons that you know I'm going to say. Just hit all those buttons. Uh, go into comments uh, on Cole Evans' podcast and please leave a comment. It can just be a row of emojis. I don't really care. Uh, we hit new and noteworthy with a previous podcast, and I want to do that again. So I have seen on uh, a lot of your posts, and I see it today, your your shirt says win, it's crossed out, and then we see the word dominate. Tell our audience, why is that different in your verbiage? Yeah, so the don't just win dominate construct is all about, you know, it's about shaking people out of their status quo a little bit and saying, look, obviously you're there every day to kind of win the day, right? But the brands that dominate are the ones that start thinking long game strategy, not just short game execution. Yep. And so I really see a huge distinction between the acceptance of the idea of winning versus the demand of dominating, right? And so teams that win the Super Bowl, for example, are the ones that insist on domination. Lots of them won during the year. But the one that ultimately dominates everybody is the one that's willing to do the extra effort, take the time to look into things and get educated on them, et cetera. And that's really what we're trying to help our clients do. Slow down on the front side long enough mm -hmm. to get strategic again, to realize that tactics need to be put in their proper place, that they don't rule the day. Figure out what your one thing is. What is your why, if you want to use Simon Sinek's version of this? What is the purpose of the company? What are you there to do? What are you really selling? What's your enemy? Why would people care? Get that into something that's in an edutainment fashion, you know, consumer demand. And I say consumer, I mean, client, customer, your C word of choice, sure. your yeah. target audiences demand for something that is interesting and entertaining as well as instructive or educational has been driven by their existence as a consumer in the world. They, they don't just stop wanting that level of engagement because they happen to go to work. So like the brands that dominate are the ones that sit down and say, you know, we're not going to give an inch and let it become a mile. We're mm -hmm. going to focus on the inches to create a mile. And right. when we sit down and we focus that way on the development of business strategy, creative development, media considerations, outreach and engagement, the brands can't help but succeed because they're eliminating the holes in the bucket where they're successful. 
Bill, it's always a great time to jump on a conversation with you. I really, really appreciate your time. Make sure to, again, look in all the descriptions and stalk Bill like I have on LinkedIn and TikTok. Uh, I've heard you say solving for a pain point, a channel is a channel, tactics before strategy. I think that's a huge, I'm putting that on the thumbnail. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, man, I really appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much. Have a good week. Thanks, Cole.